Hi, in today's video we are going to discuss the configure menu on the Starfront program. Now this is a very important menu because this is where you set the program up to be correct for your manufacturing processes and your costing setup in the program. So when we look at the menu structure, the third menu across is the configure menu. So I'm going to click on that configure menu now and then I will see the various icons that are available in this menu. So the first icon is the system defaults. The system defaults allows you to make certain settings which are based on each individual system, extrusion system, that is available in the program. So if we go in on the left hand side, you'll see here the various systems. We can specify the default finish for that system. All these finishes are defaulting to white powder coating at the moment. We can specify the default glass. This is why every time, for example, I design a Swift 28 window, the program will default to 4mm glass. I can define how the corners need to be. Obviously on a case and window system, the corners need to be mitered. But if we go and have a look at something like clip 44, on clip 44, I can default my corners to horizontal, which means that the horizontal member of the corner runs through and the vertical member of the corner will fit in underneath it. I can then also say whether or not I want to mill the ends of my profiles. And finally, what is the amount that that mill adjustment is. Now, adjusting the, setting the milling of the ends of the profiles means that you are not going to use the uh, million connection blocks that are put between the glazing ring bait and the end of the mullion. So what has to happen if you're going to mill the ends of your mullion is you have to allow, for example, on Swift 28, an additional 2.5 millimeters on the ends of each mullion so that the ends of those mullions can be milled and they fit into that glazing recess. All right, that's what we call mullion ends and the mill adjust. So those are the defaults that you can set per system. Then we have the default profiles that we can set for each different frame. So if I click on that second icon, what I'll see here is, is a whole table. Now, there's a lot of information on this table. So normally what you would do is you would filter out just a particular system. So let's start off. Let's just say I am going to look at clip 44. So I'm going to choose my clip 44. Now I only see the clip 44 defaults. And I want to look at my regular shop front frame. Now what this tells me is how that regular shop front frame is going to be manufactured. The bead is going to default to the 13mm angled bead. The corners are defaulting to vertical on that frame. And here I can choose if I want it to be a horizontal corner or I want it to be a vertical corner. I can choose. You can see the, the drawing on the right hand side changes depending on what I choose. The frame, the default frame, is going to be a 26B, but I can choose from any of these options that is available here. So I can decide the 26B, which is the recess back, is not the one that I'm typically going to use. I prefer to use the open back, in which case I can set it to be the 26C as my default. And now every time I design a Clip 44 regular shop front frame, it will default to the 26C as the frame profile. I'm just going to set these back to the default so we don't um, fiddle anything unnecessary. My mullion, my default mullion is a 26. Now because the mullions are automated in the program, you must always set your smallest mullion as the default. Because if that mullion fails due to the deflection at the specified wind load, the program will automatically increase the size of the mullion until the mullion is strong enough. It will never decrease the size of the mullion. So if, for example, here under mullion, I set my mullion to be um, the 
uh, Malian. Okay, then the program will always start at a 95 million. It will never go back down to, say, a 26 million. All right, so you have um, your default million. You have your default sill that is going to be used on your shop front. So by default, the sill is an R4. But if you always make your, staff, your shop front using an R7 as the default sill, you can change it to an R7. And from now on, every shop front frame will have an R7. Okay, and then similarly with my transom. Once again, the transoms are automated according to the deflection at the specified wind load. So you must leave your transom and your mullion at their lowest values. Let's just set the sill back to an R4. And I can change that, just leave it as it was as the original default. Okay, so for every system, I can go, for example, now to the Swift 28. I can filter out my standard Swift 28 frames, and there I can choose each option. Now, in the lecture on color-coded gaskets, I explained to you the benefit of using the speaker's color-coded gaskets. And they are all based around the standard 13 millimeter bead available from the speaker. You do have an option to go and set the old multi-bead as an option on the program, but then please remember that your color-coded gaskets are not going to work with that old multi-bead. So if in doubt, rather leave the options as they are predefined in the program because they've been set like that for a reason. So those are our frame defaults. Then I have a similar set of defaults under my insert defaults. Now those insert defaults are still related to the system, to the insert category, and then the specific insert option. So let's say for example now, um, on all of my doors I wish to start with an R7 at the bottom of the door, not an R4. Then what I can do is I go in and I can choose my system, so let's choose clip 44. Okay, and I don't just want to look at a specific category. I don't want to only look at hinge doors or swing doors or whatever the case is. So I'm going to leave the category out and I'm going to, under the insert option, type in the word saw. And now what the system has done is it has selected all the souls for me across all of the clip 44 categories. And as you can see, there's quite a few. And by default, um, all of your hinge doors default to the uh, R4 with a box threshold, which just for reference looks like that, that drawing that we've got there. All right, I've got some of my cottage pane doors here, which are just defaulting to an R4. So if I wanted to change them all to have the box threshold, I could click on there and I could choose the option to set that. All right, so here we are not just setting a single insert category. By filling in this insert option, we can actually adjust that setting across all of those different door configurations. All right, let me, let, let me show you another example of this. Let's say, for example, we're going to go to the palace. Okay, so let's choose the palace as a system. Okay, and now what I want to do is I want to set the default interlock across that whole palace system. Now you can see there are four different palace door categories. So double track single door, double track double door, and the same with your triple track. And the interlock on all of these defaults to standard, but I could go in and I could say, all right, I want to use the 60 millimeter interlock across all of these options here. And now I will have the 60, inter 60 millimeter interlock as the default. We just set it back to the normal. I don't want to fiddle my defaults on my system. All right, so that's how you can manipulate your insert profiles or your insert defaults, um, not only according to the system, but according to which part of that system are we looking at such as the interlock or the meeting style or the sill or whatever it is about that item.
All right, so those were your frame defaults and your insert defaults. Then we have the frame components. Now the frame components basically represents what hardware or what components are utilized by default on each of the frames. So let's once again go to the Swift 28. Let's just have a look at our standard Swift 28 frame. And these are the options that you can change. You can specify the butterfly gasket, the screw to be used for the cross connector, the corner cleat, what cross connector to use, what fixing lug you want to work with, what screws you want to put together the frame, your glass setting blocks, remember there is a separate video on glass setting blocks, your mullion packer, that's that little spacer which if you turn your mullion mullion ends off then it will put that little spacer in between your outer frame and the ends of your mullion so that that glazing rebate is closed. Okay, um, then you can specify what pop rivets are used and what wedge gasket. Now once again you can see the program is defaulting to our color-coded gaskets. I have explained to you the benefit of the color-coded gaskets and you do not need to worry about what gasket is going with what type of glass. That is automated in the Starfront program. So as long as you set your default to one of your color-coded gaskets then your gasket automation will happen for you and it will select the correct gasket according to that glass thickness. All right, so those are your hardware choices or your component choices for the frame. And I can filter out any of the systems and look at that hardware and manipulate that hardware to whatever I want. If I don't use, for example, uh, if I don't use that flat fixing lug, I can double click on, on that area there. I can go through, let's just go and filter out lug. And now I will see the various fixing lugs that are available to me. Okay, and choose the fixing lug and put that fixing lug into that option. There. Okay, so you can change it. It is possible that um, certain components can be locked by the speaker. So on certain critical hardware components where the speaker don't want you to change the item because it will affect the performance of that system, it is possible. So if you try to change it, it will give you a warning, sorry, that hardware item has been locked. Okay, so those are your frame components. And similarly, I get my insert components. So let's once again just have a look at the Swift 28. Um, here we can look at, for example, the top hand sashes. On the top hand sashes, I can see um, that's my butterfly. My control mechanism is the 200 by 18 by 13 top hand 304 square screw, square groove friction stack. Now, once again, your friction stays are automated in the program. So don't change your default. Leave it at, as the smallest friction stay and Starfront will automatically put in a bigger friction stay where it needs it. I can specify my corner cleats, the rivets of my friction stay, my glass setting blocks, which is my standard handle that I want to use. So it defaults to the Creolco wedges handle. If I went in and chose, I could choose, for example, let's clear that. Um, let's choose our handles. And now I could choose any other handle that I want to put on my window. Okay, obviously you need to know what, what that handle is called. Um, find that handle and put that as your default handle for your windows. Okay, the screw used to put the handle on, my mullion packer again, my sash screw, security bars, we will have a separate video on how to include security bars in your designs, wedge and wall power. So every single profile that is utilized to make both your frames and your inserts can be manipulated and every component that is used to make your frame and your insert can be manipulated. So you have complete control over the Starfront program. You can make it do 
or manufacture that window or door exactly as you want to manufacture it. Just one word of warning, these options have all been pre-programmed with the most realistic or the recommended profiles and the recommended components. So don't just change something for the sake of changing it. Change it if every time you do a design you need to remember, ah, oh, I need to change my, my handle on that window, then you can go and change your default. And from that point on, it will always use your new default handle on that design. Remember, changing your defaults will only affect your designs that happen from that point onwards. It will not go back and modify any of your designs historically. All right, so that's my frame profiles, my insert profiles, my frame components, my insert component. Then I've got a little option here where I can go change the clearances around doors. So if we just go and have a look on the clip 44, let's just filter out clip 44. Okay, then if I look at a normal double hinge door, the gap at the top of the door is 3 millimeters. The gap at the bottom of the door is 7 millimeters by default. The gap at the lock inside is 4 mils. The gap on my hinge side is 3 mils. My meeting style gap is 4 mils and I don't have a sash gap on a, on a hinge door. Now, at the moment, we only have the option to control the gaps on your hinge doors, but we are looking at including that, for example, on a vista fold door, so that you can adjust the gaps between your vista fold doors, the gap at the bottom of the door, etc. Okay, so those are your clearances. Then the next one is quite a big one. This is where you set all your user preferences on the program. Those user preferences are broken into the following. First of all, we have our labor times. This is the amount of time in minutes which is allocated to each of your fundamental building blocks in determining your factory labor. So the program works out for you on every design, how long that should take in the factory. And these are the time estimates that it uses for that process. When we look at a separate video on the costing in detail, you will understand this a little bit better. Then I have my, a page of my financial defaults. Again, this will mean more to you when we look at our costing screen, but you can set things like your consumables, what your factory labor and your factory overheads are, your installation labor and your installation overheads, uh, VAT, customer discount, a currency conversion if you're working outside the borders of South Africa, and a few other options like that. Here you can set your discount and waste um, percentages. Now guys, please keep in mind that the price lists that are supplied uh, by your CDP are generally their list prices and you would then need to put in your section discount, your finish discount, component and your glass discount. Most of the time because you are taking your own responsibility to enter your glass prices, um, you are going to put your net price into your glass file and therefore your glass discount is normally going to be set at zero. These are your purchasing discounts. All right. Um, if you do set your glass according to a list price from your supplier, then you can go in and put in a glass discount as well. And then I have my default wastage factors. My default section wastage factor is 10%. My finished wastage is 10% and my component is 10%. The reason why I don't see my glass waste is my glass waste is actually defined for each glass type. Because I might decide that on a, on a piece of formal float, a small offcut is something I can use, for example, to do cottage pain. So my true wastage goes down. Whereas if I'm working on um, laminated glass, I have less use for those offcuts, so my wastage factor goes up. So you can set on your glass file a different wastage for each type of glass. And that is covered in the video on... Uh, the file menu. Okay, then we have some general settings that we can control. Uh, we can control the width of the blade of our saw. Yes, that is important because every time you cut a piece of material, you are going to lose that four millimeters of 
played with. We can control our wastage per length. Now that is, if I take a full brand new length of an aluminium profile, how much do I have to trim off to get the edges squared, to get the jigging marks off, or the damaged edges sorted out? Okay, the program is defaulting to 75 mils. All right, you might be able to get away with less, particularly with Wispico's new powder coating plant. You can get away with a smaller gap uh, or smaller wastage per length. And then you've also got a figure for your wastage per mitre. So if you're using a double-headed saw, every time you do a double-headed cut, you lose a certain amount of material, and that is defaulting to 25 millimeters on the system. Then I can define an overall default finish on my program, which I've got set to white. I can define overall default that my glazing is defaulting to single glazing. They can choose single glazing, double glazing, or mixed. It's advisable to leave that on single. Then I can define my default region as either inland or coastal. This region is only used in the selection of your hardware or your components. So there are certain components that are not recommended for coastal areas. So if you set your program or your a particular contract to default to coastal, then there might be some hardware items that it says, sorry, that hardware item is not recommended in the coastal area. And you would have to go into your defaults and change that hardware. I'm going to leave mine based on inland for now. Then I have my default wind load. Okay, if you haven't watched the video on wind load, I think that is the, the very first video, lesson number one. Watch it so that you know what to set your default wind load in your program according to whereabouts in the country you are operating. And then I've got a few settings at the bottom here which um, you don't fiddle with if you don't know what they are. If you ever need to change it, we would change it for you through TeamViewer or we would help you over the phone to change that. And then finally, and probably the most important one, is my quote settings. There's various things that I can do to manipulate the format of my quotes. One of them is just to leave a certain amount of space at the top of the quote for my letterhead. Um, that space is actually specified in pixels, unfortunately, it's just the way the program works. So you might have to say, all right, I'm going to allow 200 pixels, uh, do a printout, see if there's enough space for your letterhead, if not, then you can increase it or decrease it. Okay, um, That amount of space only gets applied to the first page of your quote. Then I can put in a simple quote footer if I want. Um, if I don't have an official scanned letterhead, then I can use the program to create a letterhead for me by clicking on this button which is create letterhead. And on this button here, let's just get rid of the nonsense that was filled in here. Okay, it will pick up my company name for me, Stargate Aluminium, that you can change on your registration screen if you need to. Then you can fill in your postal address, your physical address, telephone number, fax number and cell number. And what it will do is it will just create a simple text letterhead for you which can appear at the top of your quotes. All right. Once you've done that, just ensure that this small um, checkbox is ticked which says use auto-generated letterhead at top of quote. All right. If you turn that off, then even if you've created a letterhead, it won't show that letterhead at the top of your quote. Um, Alternatively, what you can also do is you can take a bitmap image, it can be um, a JPEG image of your existing letterhead. All right. The recommendation is that you make that image 1440 pixels long by 240 pixels high. And then you can include that at the top of your letterhead. So if you click on, on that button, you could go in, I'm just going to have a look, for example, I've got a little sample one here, which is called letterhead image, and I could include that. So now every time I print a quote, it will include that letterhead image at the top of my quote. And you can manipulate and edit that through any bitmap editor, even, um, even normal paint that comes with Windows will be capable of editing that file. 
If you don't want to use that let's head at the top of your page, then you just clear that box out and you, you put nothing in there. And then finally, in terms of your quote layout, you can set your terms and conditions at the bottom of the quote. Now here you can select any RTF file. So I've got a file here called terms and conditions.rtf. Now an RTF file stands for real text format, and that can be generated by a program like Microsoft Word. All right, so you can edit that. If I can even edit it through here by clicking on the edit button. Okay, and then I can do whatever I want, including different color fonts, highlighting things, different size fonts. Whatever I type here will now form the footer of my, of my quotation. Okay, so those are your, your terms and conditions. Again, if I don't want those terms and conditions, I can simply clear that box. It, when you exit this box, it will tell you that it has saved all those user settings for you automatically. The next box is our program configuration. Now there's a couple of things we can do here. First of all, under the company settings, I can set the company name. I've just got mine a Stargate Aluminium. I can put my physical address, my postal address, my postal code, telephone number, fax number, cell number, and email address. So those are the contact details of your own business. On the update screen, you can specify who your stockist is. That will automatically associate with that stockist logo that comes up on the screen. If necessary, you can set a program and a price file password. Uh, there are some stockers that have specialized price lists available on Starfront and in that situation they will give you a password for the price file. This is the next program update number that it's looking for. So my program is sitting waiting for update number 310. As soon as the update 310 appears on the internet, it will automatically load that. This is my next stockist price file update number. So my program is looking for update number 9 from my stockist. Again, the minute that appears on the internet, it will download. You can adjust these, but please only adjust these if instructed to by the support guys or by the Wispico, uh, sorry, your, your CDP in terms of their price file. Okay, then it will tell you what date you were last connected to the internet. Mine is obviously today's date. The last date that the program was updated and the last date that the price file was updated. All right, then I have an advanced button. These are some advanced settings on the program. Once again, please don't fiddle with things if you don't know what those settings are for. Um, you may have noticed when, when I st um, did my video on running Starfront for the first time, I got a message that says your price file may be outdated. This is what it uses for that factor. So it says the maximum that your program can be up, um, outdated by, the number of days is 270 days, and the maximum that your price file can be outdated is 270 days. So if your stockist has not updated their price file in the last 270 days, and that message is irritating you, you can include that, you can increase that, make it a thousand days if you want, and that message will then not um, happen automatically. Um, Alright, these other options uh, below your maximum program updated and maximum price file updated um, are just regarding the automatic updating. Please don't fiddle with those. Uh, this option here you can change if you want to. Uh, when you print the reports in Starfront, every second line will have a light grey background. If you don't like that light grey background on the reports, then you can remove that tick and it won't print that um, for you automatically. Then the last tab on this page is your network tab. This is only required if you're running in a network environment. Um, you can change certain options here. When you get the program, it will default to this automatic backup on. It is sometimes necessary in a network environment that you don't want each user to do a backup each time they exit the program. So you can turn that off. You can leave it on on one of the computers, for example, and then only that computer will do that automatic backup for you. And there's a few other things, your network drive, network paths and things like that. Don't fiddle with things that you don't know what they do. All right, so that's your program options. 
These last two buttons here, it's not something you're going to use. It's something that if you're speaking to support, they might ask you to go in and click on the check frame or the check insert button. And those buttons are just, in some circumstances, someone might have changed one of their defaults to a value which is no longer valid. Uh, we can run this. This will check all your defaults. And if necessary, it will reset that invalid default back to the new default value. All right. So... The configure menu is important. It's where you make all the changes to the system for, to get the program to behave the way you want it to behave, both on the manufacturing side and on the costing side. So work with these settings, but follow the principle. Don't just change something for the sake of changing it. If you have a need to change a default, then by all means go in and change that default. But most of the defaults have been preset to the recommended value for you automatically. So you shouldn't have a need other than things like discounts and wastage factors um, and your factory labor and your factory overheads and things like that. Other than that, the default should be left fairly intact. Uh, when we do a lesson on the a more advanced cost inside in the program, you will learn how to make those financial changes to set the defaults correct from a financial point of view. Okay, so once again, thanks very much for taking the time to watch this video. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and we'll see each other again soon in another video. Goodbye.